everyone and welcome to Therapists Supporting Therapists. I am Michelle Lundstrom and today we are here with Kimberly Morrow. She is a licensed clinical social worker and she has been at this for over 15 years. She has written two books, one of them Face It and Feel It and the other one CBT for Anxiety. So welcome Kimberly. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you on here. Thank you. I, I'm very happy to be on here because this is a worthwhile uh, cause to have uh, us working towards helping other therapists. Wonderful. Well, I, I briefly introduced you, but could you tell everyone a little bit about yourself for those who may not be familiar with your amazing work? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I'm in Erie, Pennsylvania. And um, so three days a week, I see clients with anxiety and OCD, and I tend to see the most severely ill. Uh, you said that I've been doing this for over 15 years. I, I think I'm actually at 29 years, so I'm almost at the 30-year mark. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to believe, but I'm, I'm absolutely passionate about helping people live well with anxiety and OCD. And then the other days, um, I have a, a business called Anxiety Training. That's both online, where therapists can... Uh, get easy access to webinars and online courses about anxiety and OCD. And then I travel all over the United States giving in-person workshops. Um, my goal, I figured out pretty quickly, is if I'm not teaching others how to do evidence-based uh, therapy for anxiety and OCD, then, you know, it's, I can help one person in my office, but I can help hundreds and thousands of people if I'm teaching therapists. So I, I'm grateful for what I do. I love it. Absolutely. And we're so glad that you do that because we all... We all need that training and as we, we also have our own anxiety that we're trying to manage. And as I'm thinking about the books that you've written and the workshops that you teach on managing anxiety, I think about us therapists as we sit on the front lines with our clients. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering what are some of the ways as mental health professionals, we can empower ourselves to manage anxiety that many of us are feeling as we're working during a pandemic. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I was thinking about that just in terms of us, you know, our, ourselves having anxiety. Whenever I give workshops, one of the first questions I ask is, you know, how many of you are here because you have anxiety? And, and go ahead and start being vulnerable right away, right? And so I'm just going to start out today and say that I have social anxiety. And so every time I do something like this, and I do this a lot, get up in front of people, know that people are watching me, it triggers my anxiety. Um, in terms of if you're watching this now and you struggle with anxiety yourself, I think one of the most powerful things that we have is presence, right? Uh, we know that anxiety, um, anxiety in and of itself actually isn't a problem. It motivates us to do things we can, um, you know, it, it helps us um, show up and be prepared. Uh, but if we begin to fear having that feeling, because anxiety can feel pretty awful, and if we begin to fear it and worry about, you know, how will we handle it tomorrow or a year from now, if we're still doing this quarantine a year from now, um, that's when it really begins to hijack us and we don't have presence anymore. I think one of the wonderful things as therapists is we do have clients, and so either you're doing teletherapy or maybe you're wearing masks and they're in your office, or maybe some of you are taking walks with your clients. But I think the beautiful thing about being therapists is we can really choose to be present with our clients and, and kind of teach our brains that this is where I'm choosing to be rather than hijacked into the worry of the future. So I think presence is really important and hopefully all of us have learned a little bit about mindfulness and practicing presence. I think gratitude is really important. Um, I'm always teaching my clients that even though it feels like you don't get to choose how you experience this moment, um, we're trying to get um, people with anxiety to get in the driver's seat and drive their emotional brain rather than letting their emotional brain drive them. And gratitude is just a wonderful way to do that because um, you're choosing to look at what you do have versus what you don't have. And it's a slippery slope, right? Like literally I woke up this morning and I was thinking, I was thinking, oh gosh, it just feels like I don't have the freedom to go do what it is that I want to do. And then immediately I felt anxiety kind of grab me. And, um, and then I was like, oh, I'm not even, I don't even want to exercise this morning. I think I'm just going to let myself have the day off. And so I, I started to do that thing, right? And so then what I did was I got up and I had my cup of coffee and I just thought, oh, this is so delicious. And actually, I am grateful that I get to go to work this morning and I get to have a conversation with you this morning. And then I saw on Facebook that one of my exercise classes was live as I was sitting and drinking my coffee. And I'm like, get going and let's, let's do this. So as soon as I shifted to being grateful, then my, my mind and body kind of went with me that way. So I think that's an important thing as well. 
I just love that about um, about what you're saying is um, to to embrace it. Like we're not trying to get rid of anxiety or villainize anxiety. And I think a lot of things start to villainize anxiety. Like it's something we need to eradicate. And I agree with you that it's something that we need. Like whenever I get feel anxious, I'm like, okay, this is my procrastination alert system. What am I procrastinating on? Let me uh -huh. evaluate what's going on. Or is this completely manufactured and you know, I need to, to shift. And, and those are great tools thinking about moving into gratitude. And, and I love that example. Yeah, I, I think, you know, what you're saying about, you know, we don't want to get rid of anxiety. That is like so important. And, and being curious about it and trying to decide, is it here to teach something about procrastination or to get us to, you know, exercise? But sometimes, I mean, with my clients, you know, sometimes I'll just say, I'm just having this free floating anxiety today. Have you experienced that before? And what do you do with that? And, and so the goal isn't to, to act as though we don't have anxiety as therapists. The goal is to, with our parents, our, our parents, with our clients, walk that path um, and be able to just be in it and be curious about it, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. So I've also heard from mental health, health professionals that it would be really helpful to have some information for managing that anxiety and those OCD symptoms or traits while working from home. Do you have any, any tools or tips that therapists could add to their toolbox to support themselves? Well, I guess first I just want to make sure that if you're a therapist and you have anxiety or OCD, that you yourself um, are knowledgeable about how to, how to be well with it. So I, I hope you know a little bit about exposure and response prevention therapy. It's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. And, um, and I think the goal of that is to be able to walk towards the fear and tolerate the discomfort and the uncertainty, right? So at least I know for a lot of my clients, um, and I see therapists as well, some of the uncertainty going on right now is what is this going to look like, you know, tomorrow, next week, next year. Um, others as therapists has to do with like our billing, like, you know, I don't know if any of you are struggling with some of your insurance companies as we transferred over to um, telehealth, some of the insurance companies are having a difficult time <laughs> getting us our money. Um, and so... Then there's a, the third thing that's coming to me too is, and that is the rules of um, quarantine, right? You know, every week, at least where I live, it's changed from, well, masks don't work to now everybody has to have a mask in order to leave their house. And, and so I think people are really confused. And if you have OCD, OCD is always looking to um, kind of jump on your back when you're vulnerable. So if you're feeling fatigued, if you're not taking care of yourself, um, if, you're, if you're not handling the uncertainty of these um, times very well, then OCD is going to kind of start knocking on your door and say, well, wait a minute, you know, um, I know people said that we'd get paid, you know, within 30 days, but it's been 25 and we haven't been paid. So you better get on and start Googling and looking that up, right? Or I know that they say that you should have six feet distance, but you took a walk with your friend yesterday and I'm not sure you were exactly six feet. So what I like to say is, first of all, follow the CDC guidelines, not the OCD guidelines. Mm -hmm. And that means that when you notice that your OCD is activated, it's kind of trying to talk to you and get you to listen to its rules. I really would ask you to, to just sit down and get to know how OCD is tricking you um, and then develop a strategy so that you're just kind of saying, hey, I know you're knocking on my door and I have no intentions on, on opening it. In fact, now that I know that you're trying to get me around the CDC guidelines or around um, am I going to get paid or am I not going to get paid? I'm actually going to choose to let that go and do nothing with it. I say to my clients, therapy is simpler than all the ways that OCD tries to get you to feel better. And that is do nothing. So when you realize that OCD is trying to get you, like pause, notice how it's trying to trick you, and then develop your own strategy to face that fear and do nothing. And what I mean by do nothing is don't wash your hands an extra time. Don't Google search who's gotten paid from a particular insurance company. Like you would be better off just pausing. Um, and, and, and I often say to my clients, just stay. Kind of, we fostered a dog this weekend. We were still fostering a dog. And I've never had a dog before. But I keep thinking now about this dog and what I teach my clients because I'm, I'm literally saying stay. And, and we have to do that with ourselves instead of react to that emotional brain that is trying to get us to do more. 
Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I used to be a dog trainer, so it's interesting oh. you bring in the dog example, but, but you're so right. And one of the things that dogs taught me when I was training dogs was when they would get into that overthinking and they would get into that rigidity and, and really trying to please me, then they were just too anxious. I wasn't really going to teach them anything that was going to stick. And so I've been able to incorporate that for myself as well in my own work of when my brain is rigid and I'm overanalyzing everything and I'm, I'm looking at Facebook again and again in the chat forum to see like, oh, what, do I bill it this way or do I bill it that way? Or do I, right? Like, are they paying this? Is this insurance company doing it? Right? It's like that same thing that the dogs would do. And yes. so they've taught me because they're brilliant teachers when we watch their behaviors and how they interact you can just just stop right because at that yep. point you stop training <laughs> yep you, you're absolutely right and so if there's something that all of you can take away you know like i always say in my workshops like even if you only take away one thing remember this so remember do nothing you know there, there's that story of the first arrow and the second arrow and the, and the first arrow is the stressful thing that happens to us that we can't control life is full of stressful things the quarantine not getting paid that's the first arrow the second arrow is our response to that first arrow, and that's the poison dart, right? Mm -hmm. And typically our response happens very fast because of the emotional intensity that we feel from that initial stressful event. If we can just, just slow down and do nothing in that space, maybe we breathe, maybe we just continue on with our day, maybe we do something we value, but we don't respond to the emotional intensity of that, then when our emotional brain quiets down, then our wise mind can show up and, and we might have a better sense of, oh, you know what? I think I'm just going to wait and do nothing about the, the payment because it'll start to trickle in. I, by the way, I find it interesting that you're in Iowa and I'm in Pennsylvania. I don't think us therapists in Erie, Pennsylvania knew that you guys in Iowa were having the same difficulty with payment. So that's also helpful, by the way, the fact that you're listening to the two of us talk and you're like, oh, they're having the same difficulty we are. And, and at least for me, I'm just going to trust that the insurance companies are going to get this figured out because if they go longer than 45 days, they owe us interest. <laughs> so we win either way, right? We either get more money, but I think in terms of our anxious brains, it's better if we just do nothing and you know we do our billing but we don't keep trying to figure out why we're not getting paid we'll get paid yeah i think so too and, and i and i've i've sat back and, and been calm and now some of the payments are coming in and i'm like man i'm glad i didn't waste my time on the phone <laughs> and and you know the number of therapists and many of you probably are watching us right now where, where you guys did and 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 don't you know don't beat yourself up for that Right. Everything is a learn, just like you tell your clients, right? Like, so how can you learn from that? Because there's going to be another thing that tries to hijack you. And I think the most important thing is recognizing when you're hijacked, recognizing when something is triggering you, and, and then really doing some things to create that space and quiet your emotional brain. That is more important than making the phone call or getting on the chat rooms or that type of thing. Absolutely. No shame and recognizing those things help us learn about ourselves. Yes. Yeah. So speaking of learning about ourselves, I'm curious, what have you learned about yourself in this process as a healer and balancing also being a human being during a pandemic? Yeah, I have really chosen to take this time to learn as much as I can. And, um, you know, first and foremost, I'm, I'm so grateful for just that I have work, I have income coming in, I have enough food on my table, I have all my family at home, which includes three adult children and a cat and a dog. And, and again, I, I can look one way and say this is so stressful, it's not what I had planned, it's not what my kids had planned at this time in their lives. But from a gratitude place, I think I'm learning a lot and I, I hope that each of you are able to tune into you know what what is the universe teaching us right now my teaching point is 
that it's really easy to kind of um, get high on all the great feedback that I get. I love what I do. I adore my clients. Everybody gets well. Uh, the therapists that I train can't get enough of our training. So it feels like, well, then more must be better, right? So then more people ask me to do more workshops and, and um, you know, I, I, have I, have, I have easily six months of clients waiting to see me. And I think, well, if this feels good, then more must be better. And it, during quarantine, I have to wait. Mm -hmm. I can't do the in-person workshops anymore. Um, I can't see any more that people than I can be healthy seeing right now. And I have to wait. And it, it makes me think of yesterday, I was in Aldi, and you know, we, we can, you can only go one way in the grocery stores if you guys are grocery shopping. Um, you have to stand six feet apart, and you have your mask on, and I wanted organic strawberries. And the woman in front of me, was literally looking at every single container of strawberries. And I don't know how long she was there. It felt like a half hour, but let's say it was five minutes. <laughs> and I was looking at the people lining up behind me. And then eventually she found hers and, and, and left. But while I was waiting in that space, I thought, this is what I teach my clients all the time. And what can I learn right now in this waiting place? I could either be frustrated or I could be grateful that I really believe the universe is saying to me, you don't have to be everything to everybody. You can only be what you can be and first be it for yourself and just be in this space. And so anyways, I, I take walks in the woods almost every day and I'm grateful for that teaching. And, and my challenge to myself is when everything gets back to normal, how do I start to practice saying, no, I just can't do that because I want to have these spaces where I take care of myself and I slow down. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, and so much mindfulness in what you just shared as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mindfulness about... is a wonderful way of being with anxiety because, mm -hmm. you know, if we can be with discomfort, then we don't have to fear it. Mm -hmm. And anxiety grows when we fear it. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So if we're standing in line at the grocery store waiting to get at the organic strawberries, or if we're in between sessions and, and we have a really packed and busy day, um, do you have any, uh, you've talked about breath exercises and gratitude. Do you have anything you'd be willing to, to teach us today and give us a little sample? You know, I, I think what I'm just going to tell you or, or teach you is what kind of breathing helps activate the parasympathetic nervous system because every client I have, and I, I, don't, I don't care if they're, you know, the, the head of a hospital system or they're, you know, eight years old and have had, you know, a year of therapy already. When I say to them, show me the kind of breath that you take when you're really, really stressed and you finally realize, oh, I'm just, I'm going to take a breath. Um, and, and maybe you and I can do it together. But typically when someone's super stressed out and they take a breath, um, they might do something like this. Mm -hmm. And so what did you notice when I was breathing? What part of my body was moving? You, um, you did an inhale and then you made a sound on the exhale, but yeah, your, your mm -hmm. shoulders. You my my shoulders went up, right? And, yeah. and, and was my inhale or my exhale longer? Do you, do you, do you remember? Could your you tell? Exhale was longer. My exhale, well, that would be good. Um, because typically when people take a breath, they take a really big inhale. <sighs> So they take a long inhale and they use this part of their body. And what that does, and this is the part that some of you may not know, what that does is that actually activates the sympathetic nervous system because the more oxygen you take in, the more your brain says something must be going on because we just had to bring in a bunch of oxygen. And if you need a bunch of oxygen, you might need to move because a saber-toothed tiger is coming after you, right? Mm -hmm. So the more oxygen you take in, the more your brain is going to release chemicals for you to be alert and for you, and, you, know, and for you to be able to move. Um, now, if you're really tired, by the way, in session, you've had four in a row and you're like, oh my God, I can't get through another. Take that, take a, a sh you know, make it only through here, take three or four big inhales and short exhales and you'll wake up and feel a little bit anxious probably, okay? But, <laughs> In between sessions, if you're trying to take care of yourself and you're trying to say to your brain, hey, you know, we're in a calm, quiet environment and we're just going to be chill right here, 
Then the breath you want to take is actually a longer exhale. And pretty much everything I teach is do the opposite. So we're actually going to start with an exhale, and then we're going to take a shallow inhale. So we're going to do a long exhale, and then just a, a regular inhale or a shallow inhale, okay? And we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to increase our carbon dioxide levels, and we're actually going to decrease our oxygen levels. And you'll see the difference of what that feels like, okay? Okay. Okay. So let's go. And, and if, you, if you need a visual with it, I like to say blow out the candles and smell the flowers. So you're just doing a with the with the inhale and then a with the exhale okay all right so what we'll do is we'll take three of those and i'll be doing them as well you also want the breath to go all the way down to your belly so when you're blowing out you're bringing your belly in and then when you're breathing in your your belly should be going out like a balloon you're putting air into the balloon okay okay all right so you can watch my hands so we're going to start with blowing out And now you're going to take an inhale. And now you're going to take an exhale and it's going to be longer. And now you're going to take an inhale. And now you're going to take an exhale. So the key thing there, remember, one thing you guys are going to remember is do nothing when your emotional brain is activated and you're triggered. Just hold the space. This one, please remember, longer exhale and get it down into your stomach. People think when you're anxious, you feel like you need more oxygen, but you actually need less oxygen and more carbon dioxide for your brain to say, oh, everything must be cool. Um, we don't need to go anywhere. Okay, so just remember the longer exhale, you take three of those and it should quiet stress. It should, you know, if, if you're feeling like you want to cry, it'll quiet the tears, even though crying is fine, but um, not, not when you're in the middle of session, right? Um, or in between sessions. So, so three breaths with a longer exhale just quiets things down. Wow, beautiful. Thank you so much for those. Those were wonderful. I feel so calm now. <laughs> It, it's amazing how in three breaths you feel the difference. Yeah, I love that because it doesn't take a whole lot of time. Like we did that and it was very quick, very effective. I feel very calm and it, it's not like another thing on my to-do list. Yes, I had a client say to me once, she says, I could write a book on how it could take me the entire day to do everything in order to be a healthy individual. I've got to exercise, I've got to meditate for an hour, I've got to be mindful, I've got to take a walk in the woods, I've got to be kind to my children. And I laughed and I'm like, it has become itself the, this obsession with how do we meditate in between clients for five minutes? No, just breathe. But, but just breathe in a way to teach your brain that you're quiet and calm and, and connected rather than stressed out. Longer exhale. There we go. And a great topic for a book, self-care anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So I'm just wondering if you have any last words of wisdom before we wrap up today that you'd like to share with this community. You know, I think the last thing I just want to touch base on is that we're all doing teletherapy now. And, and for some of us, um, I've been doing it for, I don't even know, five or six years. Other people, like you just got started. And um, I just want to challenge you to do it imperfectly. Um, to, uh, in fact, you know, Michelle was saying to me, hey, if there's something you want to edit out of this, just let me know and I'll make sure I edit out. And I said, no, I've got social anxiety and my challenge is to do things imperfectly and let people see them. And, and so I would challenge all of you to, you know, when you're starting your teletherapy sessions with your clients, just say, hey, this is new for all of us, and it's a little uncomfortable, and there's a little lag time, and, and we might, the internet might get disconnected, so have a phone nearby. Um, I'm, I've actually been laughing the last few days because I, I had one uh, a CEO of a company have to have his five-year-old a part of our sessions, and that five-year-old went, well, I don't know where he went, but he went around the house, and he came back with five scissors in his hands. <laughs> I say, okay, this is where we pause, and you go ahead and you attend to your five-year-old. And then I had another little girl who, who had earned a reward um, for doing some exposures, and she was playing with a reward, and it, it had 
it was a squishy thing and she squished it and it popped open and little gel beads went all over the computer, all over everything. And, and so I guess my point is have some fun during teletherapy. Don't be so serious. This is a great opportunity for us to practice what we teach our clients, which is be flexible, um, allow for the uncertainty and the, in, you know, the things that happen that don't go well and just be kind to yourself. Absolutely. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share all of this brilliant wisdom with us. Oh, you are welcome. Take care, everybody. All right. This is Therapist Supporting Therapists. Please like and subscribe. And thank you, everybody. Bye.